important message today. We're going to be continuing in our series of the burning ones. Let's go ahead and put our hands together for Pastor John. Thank you. Can you keep your hands going for our online family? We want to welcome all of our Zion online family. Each person, we want you to know that we see you. We love you. Thank you so much for joining us. How you guys doing? You doing good? Awesome. Uh, very, very excited for conference. Excited for this series leading up to conference and, and post-conference. All that God is going to do after that moment. And uh, man, you're here for a special day. And God brought you here on purpose. So just want to say that. Uh, we see you and we love you. Anything that we can do to help you in your spiritual journey, we're here to help you take any next step. That, that the Lord puts on your heart. Uh, with conference, man, it's really special to me. And I know we've been talking about it, but it's really important when we think about the why behind conference. Why do we do Zion Conference? And we've done it now. This will be our third year in a row. Why do we do it? It's because we truly believe that one encounter with the living God can change the course of someone's life. One encounter with Jesus can shift the course of your eternal destiny. One moment in God's presence can break you free from something that you may have been struggling with or your family has been struggling with for generations, and a new story can be written. It's an opportunity. Last year, we had over 120 different churches, people from over 120 churches represented at one conference. It's an opportunity to encounter God, to unite the church, and to advance the kingdom of God. And it's so special to me personally because God's marked me at conference, and God's marked our church. We, we had a, a leadership team meeting not long ago, and we invited our leaders to draw on a piece of paper their most impactful moment thus far being at Zion Church. And all across a wall, we had them post it on the wall. And the vast majority of those pictures that were presented on the wall were from a moment at one of our conferences where someone was healed, where God met someone, where God called someone, God shifted someone's destiny, where a family member was saved. Uh, there are critical life-changing moments that happen at conference. And for me personally, last year's conference, it just kept building. And then Saturday night was the Brian Barcelona night. Anyone there for that Saturday night experience? And he was leading us through kind of an activation message on the power of praise and different forms of praise and how they can really just unlock our relationship with God and things in our lives. It was so powerful. But I got a little like scared, if I'm going to be honest, when he got to this point about undignified praise, I'm like, is that something we can just talk about? I really hope he's not going to call us to like activate that. He's like, you know, King David, when he danced out of his clothes, he was undignified before the people. Are you ready? I'm like, no, 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 no. Because I'm like, I got these other pastors that I invited by me in how am I going to look? Are they going to respond? Like, how, like, what are they going to think about this moment? I got, I, got, I got my friend in my small group. He's literally right next to me. Like, am I going to go for it first? Is he going to go for it first? And I remember he goes, one, two, three. And something just came out of me. Dancing like a child. Leaping undignified. There was like some... Yeah, I didn't know I had that kind of fire. I knew I was passionate for Jesus, but there was this like warrior cry that came out of my mouth. And if you were there for that moment, it was like, personally, I've never experienced a moment like that with so much passion, unity, and like just ferocity for God in one moment in my entire life in any church gathering. And I was like basically born in a church. Something was released in that moment. Something was unlocked in my life personally. It was called breaking the fear of man off my life. And I had levels of the fear of man broken off my life, but this was an area that God just, just needed to 
break in the form of worship, in the form of praise. And so there will be areas in your life that God will highlight where he wants to break you free from, where he wants to give you life and liberty. And I just, I gotta say, what if this moment wasn't just for you? If one encounter with Jesus can literally change everything, who in your life can you think of right now that needs that encounter with Jesus? Who in your life right now can you think of if they just got to Zion Conference, if they just encountered Jesus, perhaps he could save their life. Perhaps they could experience healing. If they just got to, man, they have so many gifts, talents, and abilities, but if that was channeled for Christ and his kingdom, wow, what would happen? If they just got to Jesus, what friend, what neighbor, what family member needs to get in the room and encounter the life-changing presence of Jesus? This has been our vision as a church since day one. Our vision has always been to see the lost saved, the saved ignited, and the world changed. And the theme verse for conference in this entire series reveals to us that this is Jesus' vision. In fact, in Luke chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus says, I have come to set the world on fire, and I wish that it were already burning. What if we gave Jesus his wish? What if we were the church? What if we were the people? What if, what if we were the region that gave Jesus his wish? A world set on fire for him with an all-out passion, commitment, and devotion to him. What if we led the way? See, the fire that Jesus came to ignite is a fire that transforms every person, every place, and every space. There is nothing closed off to it. There's no firewall that can extinguish its spread. And we at Zion Church from day one, we believe that the fire that Jesus came to ignite includes a prayer and worship movement where we don't just talk about the power of prayer, but we're the kind of people that say, hey, we're going to show up four Tuesdays in a row and believe for revival in our land. We're going to believe that prayer makes all the difference. We're going to be a people founded upon the presence of God, the power of prayer and freedom and worship. That's the fire in our hearts that he came to ignite. The fire that he came to ignite includes the restoration of family, where things like foster care and adoption become the new norm, where the marginalized and the vulnerable are, are cared for. A place that flips the divorce rate on its head here in Orange County. You've heard me talk about it likely before. We have one of the highest divorce rates in the country, close to 72% of marriages that start do not last. And we believe that the fire that Jesus came to ignite is a fire of faithfulness, a fire of covenant, a fire that creates a new generation of marriages that go the distance, that flip that statistic on its head. A multi-generational community that loves and serves one another. We believe that the fire that Jesus came to ignite includes life, liberty, and impact, widespread salvations, miracles, and healings. We believe that this isn't something that we're starting, but this is something that God started 2,000 years ago through Jesus Christ, and we just want to ride the wave with what the living God still wants to do. We believe that world-changing leaders are to be equipped and empowered and released into their God-given destiny in every place of life. That's why we believe that the fire that God came to ignite starts at Zion Kids because there's no junior Holy Spirit. We believe that it's going to run through our middle school and youth ministry, our college age students. We believe in kingdom builders that business leaders and people in every sphere of society can make an eternal impact and difference upon our region. 
The fire that Jesus came to ignite that's been burning in our heart before we've planted this church is to see a region transform that eventually transforms a state and our world. We see coffee shops and cul-de-sacs and we see businesses and, and areas in our communities that are buzzing with the life-giving message of Jesus. Have you heard about Jesus? Have you, have you heard about this community that you can belong to? Have you, have you heard that you can experience not just community, but a purpose that's bigger than yourself? That we would bring hope to the hopeless, that we would bring change to a world by laying our life down and serving it. This is the fire that Jesus came to ignite. This is the revival that we long for. Anyone in here long for that same kind of revival? Anyone want to be a part of a great move of God? Life is short. Why not be a part of a great move of God while you live in it? In Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells us what's required for revival. Did you know that revival doesn't just happen on its own? Yes, we pray for it. Yes, we long for it and we desire it. But Jesus tells us in the full context of Luke chapter 12 what's required for revival. Jesus said, I've come to set the world on fire and I wish it were already burning. Dot, dot, dot. Because let's be honest, that sounds pretty cool. I want to be a, I want to be a person that's on fire. I want to go to a church that's on fire. I want to be a part of a movement that's on fire. I want, I want to see the world on fire for Christ. And then he goes, here's how it happens. I have a terrible baptism of suffering ahead of me. And I'm under a heavy burden until it's accomplished. The fire comes through sacrifice. Then he goes on. Do you think that I've come to bring peace to the earth? No, I've come to divide people against each other. Wait, is this the same Jesus talking? Is this the same Jesus that allowed kids to hang around his neck? Is this the same Jesus full of compassion for the leper? The same Jesus who talks about unity and peace? Is this the Prince of Peace? talking about division. In fact, in some of your Bibles, if you're reading from like a hard copy or a Bible app, you're going to have a heading above this part that talks about fire and transformation and revival. You're going to have a heading that says Jesus causes division. Hmm. He said, from now on, families will be split apart, three in favor of me and two against, or two in favor and three against. He uses the closest the closest um, context of loyalty, especially back in that day in his, the ancient Jewish uh, time period in that context, and he says, this, this revival is going to require such radical commitment to me that will, it will even impact your deepest and closest relationships. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. You don't really need Jesus for that. It just kind of happens. And daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. <laughs> Jesus causes division. Huh. Now, Scripture always interprets Scripture, so we know that Jesus can't be talking about the disintegration of the family unit because the context of the Bible, God established the family unit. God said, be fruitful and multiply. God blesses the family. So what is Jesus talking about here? Is he talking about the ripping apart of relationships, that that's a good thing, a positive thing? Or is Jesus talking about the results of radical commitment to him? What Jesus is talking about and what's required for real revival is a radical form of discipleship that is modeled in an all-in allegiance to Jesus Christ, no matter the cost. Even if it means those closest to you will not get it. There are those in here in our room that 
are facing current opposition in your family. You're, you're facing a ton of pain, a ton of hurt. You might even be ostracized from certain family members because you've decided to follow Jesus. And I want to applaud you for your courage. Because that takes commitment. And what Jesus is saying is that if you want real revival, it isn't easy. If you want real revival, it has a cost. But if you really, really follow Jesus, the life on the other side, the freedom on the other side, the purpose and the impact that comes on the other side always outweighs the cost. If you're taking notes, the title of my message today is The Line in the Sand. It, it, it was 1836 during the Texas Revolution. Anyone here from Texas? You always know if someone in the room is from Texas. You were supposed to already make noise when I said Texas. Um, there's a love for Texas. And, and I think here's in many ways where it comes from. In 1836, the Texas Revolution, there was something called the Battle at the Alamo, the Battle of the Alamo. We've heard of this. It, it, it was when Santa Ana's forces, the the Mexican forces that were vastly outnumbering the Texan army, the Texan forces, were descending upon the mission called the Alamo. And it was in that moment where there was a point of decision. Are we going to run away or are we going to fight for the freedom of Texas no matter the cost? Where Colonel William B. Travis in 1836 brought this small group of Texas soldiers together, and he literally, with his sword, and I apologize for the duct tape sound, but this is important. I want to show you what he did. He took his sword of duct tape, How satisfying is that sound? <laughs> and the colonel drew a line in the sand with his sword. And he told the Texan soldiers, he said, I know this doesn't look good, but if you care more about the fight for freedom and inspiring others, if you are willing to fight no matter what the result is, if you want to live with courage and not fear, I want you to cross the line. And every single soldier crossed the line besides one. And we remember the Alamo because the end result was the laying down of their lives at that mission, at that battle. But through their sacrifice through their commitment, through their radical decision to draw the line and say, we are going to fight for liberty, we're going to fight for freedom, no matter the cost, it inspired the other Texan troops as they fought more battles years later. It became a symbol of resistance and sacrifice. To this day, we still remember the phrase, remember the Alamo. Because later on at the Battle of San Jacinto, the Texan army led by General Sam Houston decisively defeated as they cried out, remember the Alamo, remember the Alamo, remember the Alamo. They decisively defeated Santa Ana's forces securing Texas's independence from Mexico that day. Because at one point, there was a leader, there was a person willing to draw a line in the sand and say, no matter the cost, we are going to fight. And here's what I want to tell you. Jesus Christ came to not bring fluffy peace to the earth. Jesus did not come to bring, in, he didn't come to bring tolerance where everyone can just do their own thing and act like we're getting along. Jesus Christ came, took on flesh, humbled himself to the cross 
to fight not against the world, but for the world, to save the world, to rescue the world. And he laid down his life because he knew what was happening on the other side. He knew what he's saving you from, and he knew what he's saving you for. He's saving you from separation from God for all of eternity in hell, and he's saving you for a beautiful home in heaven and and eternity with your God. I don't know about you guys, but man, that that story inspires me. I want to remember the Alamo when I think about the revival that I believe God is dreaming of here in Orange County. I, I, I want to see the kind of revival like we have yet to witness in the history of this land. I want to see altars filled with people that are burning for God, people that were prodigals, that were lost, that are running back into the loving arms of God. I, I want to see messy growth like the early church where they had so many people that were wanting to be a part of this movement of Jesus that was raw and real and beautiful where they couldn't even contain the growth. I, I, I want to see cities turned upside down. I want to see this kind of movement stand the test of time that will echo through the halls of heaven and inspire my kids and my grandkids to live a life of commitment and courage. How about you? And here's what I found. Real revival will only come through a radical commitment to Jesus. I have come to set the world on fire, and I wish that it were already burning. But then Jesus says, I have a terrible baptism of suffering ahead of me, and I'm under a heavy burden until it's accomplished. In order to see a real revival, this call to radical discipleship, involves a call to the cross. A cross, when you think about it, has a vertical line and a horizontal line. It's in the form of an intersection. And at the cross, we see our Savior, Jesus Christ, that chose to give up his life, to lay it down so that you could experience the forgiveness of your sins for all of eternity. But... It requires you to make a decision to come to the cross. This line right here reveals the first requirement for revival, which is real repentance. We cannot have real transformation in our personal lives, and we cannot have public revival that we all sing about and pray about if we first do not have personal repentance. Repentance means a complete change of mind and direction, a 180-degree turn. The reality is, is that this is the message that Jesus preached, John the Baptist before him preached. This is the message that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, where so many people got saved This is the message that Paul preached, and it cost them their lives. But look what's come from it, you sitting here today. See, a lot of us, we want the fire of God, but there's stuff in our lives that's keeping us from experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit because we're still enslaved to the power of sin. And repentance is not a message preached about very often in churches anymore. But it needs to be preached about because John the Baptist preached about it, Jesus preached about it, Peter preached about it, Paul preached about it, and he said, this is the power of God to save souls. The message of repentance is the only message that has the power to save you because you will never think you need saving if you don't think you're a sinner. A lot of people think that they're good and they just need Jesus to make them a little gooder. No, you're a sinner and I'm a sinner and we need a savior. Not a popular message, but don't scrub that from the, the video and the audio online. Because here's the deal. 
You want to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. You want to live with purpose. You want to have peace where there's no secrets. Like, you want to have relationships that are healthy. You want to have a marriage that lasts. You want to have this amazing family dynamic. You want to live pure. You want these things, but you're still hanging on to carry on luggage that cannot make it into your destiny where God wants to take you. And some of us are, are standing like this. We got one foot that says, I love God. And then we got one foot that says, I can't stop doing this. And let me just tell you, I know it's not easy, but the cross is where things die. And it can die today. The cross is where things like Jesus laid down his life so that you could have it. You need to lay it down today. God wants to break you free from it today. In a moment, you can turn from your old ways, your old story, old addictions, old relationships. All of this stuff over here will not bring you the life that you long for out here. You have to and lay it down at the cross, and God will exchange it for salvation, mercy, daily peace, forgiveness, grace, purpose, fulfillment, freedom, power. What needs to die today so that you can live? The first call to radical discipleship is the call to the cross. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day is the day where you cross the line of faith and you go from hobbling to running. A call to radical discipleship secondly includes a call to commitment. The reality is, is that we're all committed to things. The question is, what are you more committed to? See, sometimes when preachers talk about commitment, at least I've heard this, and this is the way I've interpreted it, when people are like, Jesus has to be your one thing, your only thing. You're my, you're my only thing. You're the one thing that matters most. Like, you're, you're that, you're everything. Sometimes I feel like I don't have permission to care about anything else in life. Anyone else feel that? Like, I feel guilty caring about fantasy football today. I feel guilty caring about sports or, or caring about, you know, food, like the quality of food. Uh, I feel guilty caring about other things. Um, the, the, the Bible, when it talks about commitment to Christ, it's not living some under some illusion or fantasy that you don't have other earthly commitments that are important. Like, I, I meet some Christians that when they get on fire for God, they think they have license to forget about everything else in life. I don't need to pay my bills anymore. I've got the provision of God. No, 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 like, taxes are real. Bills are real. And actually, Jesus said, pay taxes to Caesar. Like, give to Caesar what's Caesar and give to God what's God's. The, the, the question isn't, should I ditch all of these commitments? The Holy Spirit will give you direction on that. Because the reality is, is it's like purging your closet. Today we're talking about the, re, the refiner's fire. You need the refiner's fire before you get the fire for other stuff. Right? Passion, the fire of passion, the fire of revival, great. So let's start with the refiner's fire. And the reality is, is the Holy Spirit will say, just like you're purging your closet, this can go in the garage and this needs to go. And, and here's what I mean. There will be things in your life where God says, those are great things, those are good things, but it's not the most important thing. The question isn't whether you have commitments. The question today when it comes to radical, like if you want to be a burning one, if you want to be an all-in follower of Christ, if you want to be a real Christian, not just someone who has it on their bio, nothing wrong with having it on your bio, but what does your feed look like? Oh, um, <laughs> that just came to me. That must have been the, whole, the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. That's not my notes. Um, the question isn't whether or not you have commitments. The question is, what are you more committed to? Because for so many of us, um, we're, we're, and I don't know, I just feel like I'm the same, like I was a year ago or five years ago. Not much has changed. I just feel kind of, eh, in my faith. 
And I think it's because you're, you're, this is the line of commitment and everything feels equally important. Here's how uh, Jesus talked about it in Revelation chapter three, verse 15. He's talking to a church in Revelation and he says, I know all the things you do. How many of us know that in Orange County, it's, there's a lot of stuff on this line. All the things you do. I know all that you have your hand to. But, but, but you're neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. What he's saying is, I believe what he's saying is the, the biggest thing that causes us to be lukewarm is having too many commitments of equal value, having priorities that all feel of same urgency. Jesus did not come just to make decisions. Jesus came to make disciples. And disciples that are radically committed to Jesus always will see it on their calendar. They'll see it on their schedule. They'll see it in their talking. They'll see it in their lifestyle. They'll see it in their relationships that they are more committed to Jesus Christ, his will, his ways, his word, his church than anything else in life. Here's, here's what it looks like. It, 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 it looks like I'm more committed to God's word than I am to the opinions of culture. It looks like I'm more committed to prayer than I'm even committed to my own sleep. It, it looks like I'm more committed to church than I am even to my kids' sports activities. And I know that hits home, but... Here's the reality. I got four boys, and I believe that they're going to play sports, and I'm going to cheer them on, and it's going to be amazing. But, but um, you're not going to be playing lacrosse in heaven. One thing you are going to be doing, however, is worshiping the King of Kings for all of eternity. So if you don't learn to do that in a church context, how are you going to know how to do it in heaven? Oh, it, it, it means I'm more committed to purity than I am a moment of pleasure. I, I get it. This is more convenient. Let's just try it out. Let's just test drive the car. Let's just live together before we're married because we saved some coin and we can kind of test it out. And I get you, but that ain't God's word. That is not be holy as I am holy. Read Paul, read Corinthians about how our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, how we honor God and how a covenant of faithfulness. And let me just tell you, there's grace and there's mercy for your life. That's why we're in church. Come as you are, but you don't have to stay as you are because there is freedom and purity. There is life over here. Don't trade a moment of pleasure for a lifetime of pain when you can have eternal fulfillment over here. He, here's what radical commitment looks like. It looks like I'm more committed to my spouse than I am to any other human on planet Earth. It means I'm more committed to my kids than I am to accomplishments and accolades at work. Jesus said, if you try to hang on to your life over here, you're gonna lose it. But if you put a line in the sand and say, I'm more committed to God. I'm more committed to his word. I'm more committed to time in his presence. I'm more committed to becoming like him. I'm more committed to purity over pleasure. I'm more committed to laying my life down instead of trying to take up my selfish motives. I'm more committed to the kingdom of God than I am to building my own castle and a comfortable life in Orange County. You will experience peace and power and purpose and fulfillment like you have never dreamed possible in your life. Let me tell you. A line in the sand requires us to go to the cross. Real repentance. A change in direction. It requires a radical commitment to Jesus Christ before any other thing, before any other relationship. And it requires a call to courage. A call to radical discipleship is a call to courage. And let me tell you, more than 
any other time that I personally have been alive. We need courage in the church today, in the world that we live in. We need courage in our culture. We need to know, we need to be trained up. We need to be filled up with the Holy Spirit. We need to be filled up with the Spirit of Jesus to know how to speak truth and love in a culture of compromise, in a culture of confusion. The currency of the kingdom today is courage. We were in Rome this past week and we had an opportunity to tour the Colosseum and we were standing on the floor at the Colosseum. And it was a powerful, palatable experience where we were literally standing in the place where 2,000 years ago, Christians were persecuted and Christians were martyred for their faith. Emperor Nero uh, was sick in the head and he burned down the entire city of Rome and then he blamed it on the Christians. So a mass wave of persecution came upon the early Christians in that day and Rome was in such a place of turmoil, they allowed this, this emperor to persecute Christians in a tormenting and horrible kind of way. Nero would have dinner parties where he would host guests at dinner parties in the Colosseum. And for entertainment, they would burn Christians at the stake on the floor of the Colosseum. They would... If you've ever seen the movie, you know, Gladiator, where the wild beasts, the tigers and the lions would come out of those trap doors, that's a real thing, that happened. And they would bring Christians into the Colosseum and they would be devoured by lions. Because they did not recant their faith, they were crucified and burned at the stake there in the Colosseum. And as we stood there, I remember feeling their courage inspired by a legacy of faith. And as Taryn and I were weeping there in the Colosseum, she asked me, she said, do you, do you honestly think if that were you, you would be willing to die for Christ? And we were just having a conversation about it. And I sat there for a moment and I was taking it all in. And it was this moment with the Lord where I knew that I knew that I knew. And I know today, yes, I would. I would. If it came to it, where a gun was pointed to my head or where someone was standing before me and said, if you don't recount your faith, if you don't recant your faith, if you don't say that you believe in Jesus, if you say, I don't believe in Jesus, I'll let you live. But if you say that Jesus is Lord, you're going to die. I truly believe that I would be someone who would be willing to give up my life for the glory of Jesus Christ. Why? When I think about it, like Peter said, when Jesus turned to Peter, all these other disciples left. Peter, are you going to go? And Peter said, where else am I going to go, Lord? You're the only one who has eternal life. You're the only way. You're the only truth. You're the only life. And I just personally know, this is not patting myself on the back. It's like, this is a resolute courage that God has given me. But it's just, a, it's just a, yeah, of course. Of course I would give up my life for Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's the only one that came for me. He's the only one that can save me from my sins. He's the only one that said, I'm going to die, but three days later, I'm going to come back to life. I'm going to ascend to heaven, be seated at the right hand of the Father. And if you believe in me, you too shall be where I am. And then he pulled it off. He's the way, the truth, and the life. So of course, I got nowhere else to go. We're all going to die. We all can't choose when, but I would willingly give my life up for Jesus Christ. But the greater question there in the Colosseum was not, will I burn for him to my death, but will I burn for him every single day of my life? Will I live for him? Will I live for him? Because dying for Christ is but a moment and then it's gone. But living with courage for Christ in a culture of opposition and confusion and compromise, that takes real faith. And Paul said, the one who has his prison right there in Rome and was martyred right there for his faith, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God to save 
And man, I've thought about my life. There have been moments of my life where I've been ashamed of the gospel. And maybe you're here today and you'd be honest enough to say, um, I would die for Christ. I would literally die for Christ. But in my day-to-day life at work, in my day-to-day life out with strangers that I don't know, I'm ashamed of the gospel. I'm not afraid to die, but I'm afraid to talk to my neighbor about Christ. You know, it's wild how we can be ashamed of the gospel. And there's no guilt, there's no shame, but it's like, Man, I will at times find myself going so deep into a conversation, let's say about foster care, when people ask me about the four boys and how does this all work and why did you do it? I'll go so far, but then at times there's that moment where I know the Holy Spirit is like, share about why. Because Jesus laid your life down. Because he laid his life down for you. This is why God has given you and Taryn a calling to lay your life down for these children. And there's that moment where I pull back and I stay over here because I'm fearful that I'm going to ruin the relationship. And the risk of ruining the relationship outweighs the potential reward of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ that just might save their souls. Where in our lives have we been ashamed of the gospel? Because the risk of crossing this line, it feels bigger than the reward. What would a new story look like today? What if us being unashamed of the gospel, when people ask us about our faith or when people ask us about our life, because let me tell you, we run into people every single day at the park at, you know, at coffee shops, walking around our city, we meet people every single day that are hungry for God, people that are hurting, people that are broken, people that are desperate to have questions answered in their lives. What would it look like for us to be unashamed, courageous Christians, willing to risk our reputation, willing to risk the outcome so that they just might experience the life-changing, life-saving goodness of Jesus Christ. I need courage today. I need fresh faith today. For I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. And I just feel it so strongly in our church. There are so many of us that are standing up on the inside. We're standing up for God's word. We know our Bible. We're standing up for Jesus on the inside. We believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We're standing up on the inside when it comes to this election cycle and the things that we truly believe and and that informs the way that we're going to vote. And this isn't a political thing. This is just a biblical thing. Like we know why and we're standing up on the inside. We're standing up on the inside when it comes to critical issues in our day, or we're standing up on the inside when it comes to, man, yeah, I'm behind Zion's vision to see the lost saved. We're standing up on the inside and saying, yeah, but, but we're sitting down on the outside. We're sitting down on the outside. It's not enough to care about something We have to be willing to draw a line in the sand. This is where courage comes in, and it comes through the Holy Spirit, receiving the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Grant me the courage to cross the line of faith and be a radical disciple for you so that I'm not just standing up on the inside and feeling something, I'm being about something. It's not just eternal life that I'm going to get someday. It's a lifestyle that's evident. And I can, I can model it. I can talk about it. What venue has God given you? What, what sphere of influence are you in? Your place of work. 
where you live, social media, whatever outlet God has given you, maybe the public space, maybe the private sector, maybe the classroom, wherever God has placed you, what would it look like today to choose to burn for him, to live for him, to be all in committed to him, where people can see that's a courageous man of God, that's a courageous woman of God. They are not bound by fear of man. They have broken free from insecurity. They don't care what they look like or sound like because they're more committed to the lost being saved and the, making heaven crowded than they are committed to their own personal comfort. That's the church of the future. And the currency is courage. Would you pray with me? I think God just wants to release courage over us. He wants to release his Holy Spirit over us. He wants to release his presence and his power over us today. Today, we've talked about the radical nature of following Christ. And I want you to know that this is the faith that shakes the foundations of the world. If you want to be a part of a move of God, here it is. Here it is. But revival first with every head bow and I close in the sacredness of the space. No one moving around, please. Real revival begins with real repentance. And I believe that there just might be people that God's speaking to that he brought here today, or maybe you're watching online. God wants you to know that there's life on the other side of this line. You don't have to keep living into your past or generational cycles. You don't have to keep living into the lies that the enemy has spoken over your mind and your heart. You're here on purpose today because Jesus burns for you. He loves you so much. And all you have to do is simply cross the line of faith and say yes to him. And you today can be saved from your sins and set on fire to live a brand new life. If that's you, I'm going to count to three and I'm going to ask you to activate your faith in the room today. And I'm going to ask you to draw that line in the sand and say, today is the day where I choose Jesus. I repent for my sins and I recognize I need a savior and I am not turning back. Today, I'm moving forward into my God-given destiny, the future that Christ has in store for me. One, I want you to know that you're here on purpose. Two, I want you to know that you make this decision today, you become a disciple of Jesus Christ and your life will never be the same. So one, two, three, if that's you, I want you to stand right now. If that's you, you say, I give Jesus my life. If there's anyone in this place, I wanna actually invite you to stand to your feet if that's you and you want to make that commitment. I, I found it always takes the first person. We don't want to force it, but it always takes one. This is your line of demarcation. This is your moment. Today is the day. Maybe you've been wanting him. You've been desirous for God. But today is the day where you stand on the outside because that, there's that stuff on the inside where you're like, man, I want this stuff, but I've been scared. I've been fearful. I want you to know that he is a gracious God. He's a merciful God. And he wants to pull you into his loving arms. If there's anyone here, and we don't want to pressure this, but I just want to invite you. This is a courageous act. There we go. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, you see this. You see this faith. You see this courage. Yeah. Let's provide some space. I know it's bold. I know it's awkward. But it's worth it. Courage is the currency of the kingdom. Yeah. Lord, we thank you for this faith. God, we praise you that you said when one person, one lost person is found, one person runs back to you, all of heaven throws a party. And so right now we celebrate, we put our hands together and we thank you. Come on, let's all stand to our feet.
Yeah, I want to invite Taryn on up, but I do believe that not only for, this message is not only for those that are needing to cross the line of faith, but primarily what it's for is for those of us, if you're here today, you say, John, I'm kind of right here. I got a lot of stuff going on in my life and I love Jesus, but I feel kind of lukewarm. And you'd be honest enough to say, I feel kind of lukewarm. I feel kind of mad. I feel kind of bland. Things feel dry. And I today want to burn for him. I today choose to be a radically committed Christian. I today choose that no matter the cost, I'm willing to pay it if it means burning for God and seeing a real revival in my lifetime. If that's you, would you just wave your hand all over this place? Would you say, yeah, I want to burn for God. Maybe I've just been here. Yeah, I want to actually invite you. We're going to spend just, just a few moments in worship. If you'd be willing to get out of your seat. There's something about physically crossing the line of your row. Get out of your seat if you would. You can stand on the sides. You can come to the front. We're going to have our prayer team up here. But there's something about making a bold declaration to just come down and say, I'm, I, I'm sick of how things are. I want to burn for God. I want to give him my all-in commitment. I'm not willing to just keep living right here, man. I want to experience the life that's right here. Come on, I know the Lord is stirring something in people's hearts, and I just want to say, don't let anything stop you. Listen, 